Okay. Um, Doug, if you can wait just one minute so I can make sure oh. Amherst Media is, they told me they were here. I just like to be able to see that they're here before you get going. And it, it takes just a minute for the attendees to um, pop in, but okay. So Amherst Media is here, Jack, and you are the co-host. Very good. Um, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 2nd, 2021 based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jumpsick, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media Livestream. Minutes are being taken. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Uh, Maria Chow. Here. Tom Long. Here. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Uh, Jenna McGowan is not present. She gave us notice. Uh, she's not feeling well. Uh, Johanna Newman. Here. Great. And I'm here, obviously. So board members, if technical issues arise, please let Pam know if technical difficulties occur, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call, you on, call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment, join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and is also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting. You can also go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views up to uh, three minutes at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discontinued, discontinued from the meeting. So uh, with that said, uh, looking at the agenda, uh, I don't believe we have minutes. Okay, no minutes. I'm sorry, no. So 6.35, I, I see that we are at 6.30. We actually start a little bit after 6.30, but so we are at 6.35, so we actually can have the site plan review uh, meeting. So let me uh, introduce that. Ooh. Let me grab that sheet. Okay. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021-10 Emily Dickinson Museum, 280 Main Street and 20 Triangle Street. I probably should have said, yeah, that's what we're, <laughs> Emily Dickinson Museum, 280 Main Street and 20 Triangle Street. So this is what the public hearing is. Request uh, site plan review approval to replace the existing HVAC system and electrical system from the street to the homestead uh, with the addition of a pad mounted generator at pad mounted chiller and fencing of seven foot three, three inches and nine foot zero inches in height for screening. Um, off of 280 Main Street and pad mounted transformer uh, associated with 20 Triangle Street. And this is all on map 14B parcels 20, 26, and 27 
in the RG zoning district. So at this time, I'd like to ask, are there any board member disclosures? I, I see none. And then um, the applicant, uh, we have um, Jane Wall and Shantia. Is that how you pronounce her first name? Okay. So you are welcome to present your project. Thank you. I think I'll be begin and we'll hand off to Shanti in a moment. And um, Shanti, if you don't mind putting the PowerPoint up on the screen, I'll just take a quick look at the first two slides and then ask you to um, continue. Uh, but as a, uh, just a general uh, introduction to, to this project, um, you know, it's, it's good to be back with you relatively soon after the last time the museum came before the, the planning board uh, to talk about what is really the most um, ambitious restoration project we've undertaken uh, up to this point. And the, uh, the, uh, the main outline of the project overall um, is uh, to restore the main block, which is you know the what you see front and center here, um, excluding the the addition to the right to the east, um, uh, to restore the interior of that whole section uh, to uh, to be more what it was in the 19th century, based on kind of forensic investigation of the. Uh, of building changes and of decorative finishes and, and wallpapers. So that's going to involve um, uh, restoring the, the double parlors on the first floor of the homestead, um, the, the wide uh, first and second story main stair halls uh, and a transverse hall that leads from the East addition into the West, the parlors on the West uh, a room at the top of the stairs uh, and a passageway that led from Emily Dickinson's room to the room her mother occupied in the last years of her life. And um, the, there's, uh, you know, there's some telling documentary uh, accounts of uh, how Emily Dickinson herself cared for her um, invalid mother during that time. So it's an interesting story for us to be able to tell. Um, of course, the main reason we're here with you uh, this evening is not really to talk about what's going on on the interior, but to talk about what's going on on the, um, on the exterior and on the site. Um, so I think at this point, I'll ask um, Shanti if you would, um, if you would continue. Sure. Um, good evening. Uh, let's see, I'm a preservation consultant who uh, is um, working with the Emily Dickinson uh, Museum to project manage the preservation uh, aspects of this pretty exciting project. Um, the interior restorations, uh, very exciting, I think, uh, as you can imagine. Um, but one thing that it will involve is, uh, as you can see on this site plan, the uh, patched marks, the darker areas on the plan uh, are all hardwood uh, strip flooring from the 19, uh, early 19th, uh, early, excuse me, early 20th century that will be removed to expose the softwood flooring that would be familiar to Emily Dickinson, her family members. And the result of that will be that the areas that are uh, bubbled are uh, six doorways uh, in, on the left-hand side are four French doors, and then uh, to the right is the main stair hall, uh, north doorway, and south entry. Um, all of those doors were shortened uh, in the early 20th century when the softwood flooring went back in, so they now need to be uh, re-lengthened to their original um, uh, height uh, through these Dutchman-type repairs. Um, There'll be a, a little bit of adjustment at the thresholds as well to accommodate for the um, restoration of the door heights. Um, and so that's happening at um, six, six doors. 
Uh, this is the south entry. There is a bit more happening here as well, um, which is pretty exciting. What we are looking at is an early 20th century appearance. Uh, the project will restore this entry. Uh, if you look on the left, you can see uh, what is existing and below it is what is proposed for restoration. Restoring the door, again, to be familiar to Emily Dickinson. Um, the door has been on site for a number of years, so that door will be restored, uh, including the etched glass windows. And again, some changes you can see on the left-hand side uh, to some of the entry surround features to restore them back to the period of significance in the mid to later 19th century. Uh, and again, uh, some minor changes at the north entry, which is the slide on the left, and the French doors on the right. The other uh, exterior aspect of this restoration project uh, is the replacement of the existing storm windows, exterior storm windows with new interior storm windows, except at the four French uh, doors on the right. Uh, those will have custom, uh, new custom um, exterior storm windows. Uh, let's see, let me stop my share for now. Um, that's the partial interior restoration and partial exterior. It, it imposes a bit on the exterior. Uh, and then the other large uh, portion of this project is, I'm assuring your packet, we didn't pull together uh, uh, drawings for it, but it is the installation of the chiller and the generator and the transformer. The chiller and the generator are located to the north of the early 20th century garage and fenced in um, as your chair described with a wood fence that's approximately seven foot three inches on two sides and at the rear nine feet. And then a pad mounted transformer over uh, closer to 20 Triangle Street. Uh, that's primarily because it's a significantly long run from Triangle Street, which is where uh, the electric has to come in uh, over to the garage. Um, uh, it could go closer to the, to the, uh, to the garage, um, except that then it would have to be larger. So um, the choice was made to keep it smaller and somewhat shielded on the landscape. I think that that's the extent of it, Jane. Have I missed anything? Those, those are the main elements um, and we'd be glad to, to answer questions. Thank you. Um, and uh, well, I lost with all these uh, pages here, uh, what, I'm <laughs> what I'm referring to here. Um, okay, so now, all right, here we go. Uh, sorry for that. So now uh, I'd like to uh, discuss a site visit report. And Chris you know, mentioned several of the board members were able to make it this afternoon. And do we have a volunteer? I'd be happy to give a little synopsis. Okay. Um, so Doug and Chris and I and um, Andrew were able to meet with Jane um, on the site. We looked at the back of the outbuilding near the Emily Dickinson main house where the proposed chiller and generator are gonna be. Um, we discussed the fencing around um, that equipment and had a conversation about the heights of the fence um, around that. Um, we discussed the access to that area um, and then we walked further, um, oh gosh, I don't know what direction it was, but toward Triangle Street where the plan is to have a transformer on site um, in order to bring power to the chiller and the generator. Um, and I don't know, that was the extent of the site visit. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, uh, Chris, do you have your hand up? 
Thank you. I just wanted to know if um, Shantia or Jane could describe the fence that's going to go around the generator and uh, chiller area. Um, what What is it made out of and what color is it going to be? Uh, it's uh, a wood fence uh, uh, with uh, vert uh, vertical boards, vertical panels um, that uh, make the full run from uh, from the ground level up to the top of the fence. Uh, on the east side, the side that faces faces the parking pad, um, there'll be two uh, large gate gateway doors um, that'll be uh, secured together when closed uh, with hardware. The color is intended to be um, the same as the garage, which is a kind of oyster color. Thank you. Great. All right, so um, board members, uh, Doug? Yeah, I have... Uh... I have two questions. One, first, uh, when you put the the interior storms on the windows of the house, will that will expose the existing sashes to the weather? Uh, are those sashes of historic value, and uh, you know, are they better off protected with some sort of storm on the exterior? The, the existing storm windows are the whole system of interior of uh, storm windows right now. Um, they are interior storm windows, except for the uh, uh, long exterior panels over the French doors. On the uh, there are four on the west side, um, two on the east side, and one on the south, um, and those cover. Each one of those, that's a set of seven exterior panels that cover the French doors uh, on the house. And all of the rest of the system uh, has been interior storm windows for about the last 10 years. Oh. Uh, so that the um, interior storm windows that need replacement will be replaced in kind. The sash, um, the original sash, we, we think it's probably we don't think it's the 1813 sash, but uh, at some point after that, um, yeah, it is, it, those are um, of historic value. And we maintain those uh, with, you know, periodic uh, reglazing and repainting. Okay. Uh, my second question, Jane, has to do with what you just said about the fence. Um, when I look at the drawing, I see horizontal boards rather than vertical boards. I'm looking at SP1 in the lower corner, detail three. Ah, then that is my error. I'm opening the, the plan at this point. Uh, it, you know, they sort of seem to correspond to the clapboards on the garage, so that, yes. that makes some sense. Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry about that, that's my error. Jason. Okay. Uh, no further questions. Oh, may I? Um, sure. May I amend something that I said at the site visit? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and it had to do with the the, the fence, uh, the wall of the fence on the north side, which um, which is hot, taller than than the other two sides of the fence. Um, and the nine foot, the nine foot height um, has to do with uh, the the plywood sheets that support the the control panels. So the control panels um, are eight feet tall, and they're twelve inches off the ground. So that's that's the control panels then are at nine feet, and that that is actually the reason for. Um, for the height of that side of the fencing, just to shield the, so that the panels are not really visible from any, from any perspective. Good, all right. 
right. Um, Andrew, please. Thanks, Jack. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I thanks. For that. I was actually going to ask about the heights, and I think I followed you there. <clears throat> um, but maybe you could explain one more time, Jink, the the eight foot height or the nine foot high height. That's something that's being attached to that nine foot wall, or you're saying that's the height of the related to the generator and the chiller. That is, as I understand it, that's the height of the panel that, um, let's see, Shanti has put this. Yeah. And Shanti, please, uh, please help. Uh, yeah. If, if you <clears throat> so, can't so what, your control. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. We're looking, uh, we're looking west right now. Um, so facing the garage, to the right of the garage, as Jane described, are the gateway doors. The pole to the right, which is taller, um, it says, Two and a half inches by eight and a half inches sloped cap. That that's nine feet, and that's where the panel, uh, the electrical and control panels are going to be mounted. So that ends up being nine feet of plywood, which is why it's forcing the fence to be nine feet. Otherwise, you have a foot or well, almost two feet, I guess, of plywood sticking up at the back of the enclosure. Does that help? Um, I may just be dense here, so apologies. No, no, no. It's, so would... it's it's mounting to. Um... So plywood will be mounted to the back, the inside, like here of the back portion of the fence, the north. Um, can you? Is my cursor visible? I I don't know yes. whether. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so the plywood is mounted somewhere along here, and it it goes up about a foot and a half more than the seven three but we want to keep that seven foot three line because it's a better visually otherwise it starts bumping into the um roof okay. of the garage so so there's when you're in the enclosure there'll be a panel against this north fence that has all the controls for the chiller and the um the panels for the chiller and the generator Okay, I don't know if I tried to annotate the screen if you could see that or not, but that I guess that makes sense. So the purpose is not. Yes. Um, it's exactly. it's really to accommodate. It has nothing to do with visual screening because you actually would. Sounds like you probably would be able to see that from the parking lot, certainly from the building, um, because that you know you whatever if you have a panel coming yeah. off here that would all be exposed. You, you, yes, exactly. You may see a little <laughs> bit of something there. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Actually, yeah, sure, understand of course. Better. That was all I, I, I had to ask you. Thank sure. you. All right. Um, I keep losing my page here. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I guess we can open up to uh, any other board um, uh, comments. And I see none. So, um, oh, uh, Doug. Well, I thought I would just repeat a, a question that came up at the, the site visit, which was uh, whether you considered some sort of battery storage as a power supply rather than uh, the diesel fueled uh, generator solution. Yes, um, we've I had a chance to um, do a briefly check in with the engineer for the project, which is uh, quantum engineering. Um, and uh, the, the, the quick check in, the quick response is that that would be um, uh, the energy requirement would mean a much larger enclosure, a much larger courtyard than. Um, than is, is planned for the generator and the chiller. So what it would occupy uh, more space uh, would be considerably more expensive. Um, and uh, it's the engineer's opinion that it, that, um, that kind of storage solution may not be adequate to support uh, the museum during an extended power failure. And, but the, the, uh, the the answer to your question is no, not really. We didn't consider it for these reasons. Okay. 
Very good. Um, I see no other, uh, whoop, Andrew. Sorry, Jack, I just, again, kind of a click behind today. I'm just wondering whether that panel we talked about could be mounted on the west um, fence instead, which seems like it would then have no visual impact to the property or, or reduced. Well, we, um, we actually have talked with the engineer uh, about whether it could be mounted um, or even on, on the garage. The, yeah. yeah, on the garage was what we talked about. We hadn't asked about the west panel, Jane. I assume that is something we could certainly check in about, but it, but it may have to do with the, con the footprint configuration of where the generator and chiller are going because one I think is square and one's rectangular as I recall. So it, it may be a it may be a factor of where the the uh, mechanicals are being located within the caged area. There's not a not a huge amount of room there. Let's see if I can pull. Um, let's see. I'll share my screen again, and, and we can. Yeah, we we had started to walk around to the west side, and you can't you can't even get close to it. So it certainly seemed like if. You had everything there it would be quite invisible so you can see up here at the top uh it looks as though the, so the dimensions of what he needs or what he's specced uh we know that the uh panels are eight feet tall and held a, a foot off the ground um which makes it nine feet high and they're roughly 24 feet long so it may be that the west length of fence is too short to support what they need, but it seems to me it's probably something that could be explored. I mean, if it's 24, you're showing that dimension as 24, five and a half, so there's no way. Of, I mean, it's basically using up that entire north. Yes, yeah. Fence, wow. But, That's but the, huge. Question, the question about the uh, north uh, elevation of the garage, Jane, do you recall if we, if how far we got with that conversation? Um, I, my memory is that it does have to do with the length uh, and that if it were reoriented on either the west or the east side, um, it, it would intrude even more on the property line. Right. I think that was the, that was the reason for right. the orientation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, any other board comments? Okay, um, and we can open up to the public. And not sure I see any. So um, we can come back. Um, Anybody, you know, further discussion, want to make a motion? Yes, Doug. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about what color you were going to make the fence. And, you know, is it going to match the garage color or be some other contrast? No, we're we're planning on the color of the fence to be the same as the garage, which is probably best described as an oyster color. It's not not white. It's a bit a bit more tan than white. Good. Um, and I see Johanna. I'd like to move to accept. Okay. And so, so do you want to go, uh, you want to say to close the public hearing? Do we need a motion to close the public hearing, Chris? And yes, you do. Then, okay. Yeah. I will move to close the public hearing. And then you can Second. incorporate that into And then your can I go ahead and, okay. And approve the and approve the site plan review application. Plan application, perfect. Thank you. All right. Is there second? Second. Okay, Tom. All right. Any further discussion? Do you want to go through um, conditions and 
and findings and then wrap that into your um, approval? That sounds like a good thing. Um, do you have a draft? Yeah, I sent out uh, conditions and findings today. I'm sorry I didn't send it out till today, but um, Pam has it uh, and can bring it up on the screen. So we can go through that and then um, conditions I, oh, findings, yes. The findings are. Um, do findings first or did you want conditions? Let's do findings first and I'll just read through them. And if anyone has a problem with them, they can let Jack know. Okay, I'll be on the lookout for hands raised. Okay, 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and the goals of the master plan. The applicant has requested a modification of the requirements for fences under section 6.29 of the zoning bylaw. Um, section 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. All of the changes will occur on site with the exception of trenching along the edge of Triangle Street to allow an electrical connection to a utility pole on Triangle Street. A street off opening permit will be required from DPW. Section 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. No new lighting is proposed. The property lies to the north of the proposed the property that lies to the north of the proposed generator chiller area will be protected by a nine foot tall fence. Surrounding areas to the east and west be, will be protected by a seven foot three and one eighth inch fence. 11.2403, adequate recreational facilities and open space are available because the property is large and open and will include substantial lawn areas. 11.2410, unique or important natural Historic or scenic features will be protected. The proposed project will help to maintain the Emily Dickinson Museum building at the appropriate temperature and with appropriate electrical power supply. <clears throat> the Local Historic District Commission has reviewed the project and issued a certificate of appropriateness. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. 11.2412, the project is connected to town sewer and water. No changes are proposed to the sewer and water connections. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within, the adjacent, within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. No changes are being proposed to the drainage system. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The property includes significant existing vegetation that will be maintained. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. The town engineer has expressed no concerns regarding soil erosion. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit will require that exterior lighting, if any, be downcast and or shielded and are directed so as not to shine onto adjacent properties or streets. No new lighting is being proposed. 11.2418 is not applicable. The property is not located in a flood prone conservancy district. 11.2419, not applicable. There are no wetlands on or within hundred feet of the property. 11.2420, the planning board did not choose to refer the, to the design principles and standards set forth in sections 3.3040 and 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because the local historic district commission has undertaken review of the proposal and has issued a certificate of appropriateness. 11.2421, not applicable. There are no changes proposed to the setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping, and entrances and exits. 11.2422, not applicable. There will be no impacts on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. 11.2423, not applicable. No new buildings are proposed for the site and the existing buildings relate harmoniously to each other in architectural style, site location, and building exits and entrances. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate for storage areas, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, 
utility buildings and similar features. The generator chiller area would be appropriately screened with fencing and the new transformer at 20 Triangle Street will be appropriately screened by existing vegetation. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. No changes are being proposed. 11.2431. Crystal, I, have, uh, I see Andrew has his hand up. Oh. Andrew. I, I just want to give you a break, Chris. Now, I was actually, <laughs> I, I hadn't even thought about this before, but is there lighting on the back of the garage right now? And then, and sort of pardon my ignorance, but would would we need to or want to have lighting here to be able to service this? It's a pretty dark uh, area surrounded by vegetation. That would be a good question for either Shanti or Jane. Uh, I'll, I'll just begin that there's, um, right now there is lighting on the east side of the garage that's mounted on the garage itself. Um, and that, that will continue in some form, perhaps at a lower lumen. Um, but that that is the lighting for that particular area. Would that cast any light within the new enclosure, though? Uh, within the new enclosure, no, it would not. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would suspect that you would want the ability to have lighting in there, again, to be able to service this um, you know, in uh, dark hours. I, th I think that sounds right and reasonable. Okay. Um, May I say something? Yes, Chris. So um, often service workers um, bring utility lights with them if they need lighting to you know accomplish a task so we may be able to rely on that yeah i, I mean that I, I think whatever is reasonable um and if that's something that you know, we feel is reasonable that's fine it it is a pretty large area uh, and again pretty well enclosed that it would seem like having a permanent coach light or something like that would probably would probably be beneficial Like, you know, are you, Andrew, are you thinking about like what period of time, like just something, you know, 24 seven or? No, I, I just think like for, for being able to, to service this, I don't think you'd need to have it on. Oh, just a switch. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. yeah, that may be beyond the purview of this review. So apologies if I'm, you know, speaking a bit out of turn here, but it, it seems like it would be a worthwhile thing to have a part of this. Uh, it's, again, pretty big enclosure to, to light up with uh, with flashlights or, or uh, something temporary. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Doug, please. Yeah, I guess um, I don't feel strongly about the need for, for lighting out in that enclosure. I guess if, if you do put lighting, I might put it on the nine foot high wall so that it shines toward the garage rather than toward the neighbors. But uh, I mean, it seems like the proposal before us has no new lighting. So we would need to either continue or they would need to come back if, in order to alter the proposal. Is that right? You could put a condition on it that says if they do decide to add lighting in that area that they would come back and show the lighting to you. Yeah, I have to say I'm not that familiar with with the capabilities of, um, you know, um, Eversource or whoever would be, you know, maintaining this, but um, Chris, you're of the understanding they could just bring portable lighting with them. I believe so. Yep. Yeah. So I'm I'm good with that, but Andrew. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to slow this down. This is like a, a, a technicality. So I appreciate what what Doug has said, and maybe we just have 
uh, I don't know if it's just something where uh, we just ask that if lighting is added, that it is done in a manner that's dark sky compliant. And maybe that, would that be enough where they would not have to come back to us, Chris? Um, I think so, as long as you mention it. Yes, if they decide to put lighting in that enclosure, that it be dark sky compliant. Okay, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, Doug, did you have? Well, I was just gonna say, you know, there's that double double door gate on the east side of this enclosure. You know, somebody could just uh, drive their vehicle up to it and turn on the headlights. Um, so no objection to where Andrew and where we've gone with this. Okay. I did, I did have one other comment I was holding until Chris got all the way through these, which since we've had the interruption, I'll just mention uh, 11.2402, I'd like to remove the one eighth inch dimension from that uh, text. I think that's overly uh, precise in its uh, dimensional tolerances. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Does anyone remember where I left off? I think I was on 11.2430. The site has been designed to provide that for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties, no changes are being proposed. 11.2431, not applicable, no new curb cuts are being proposed. 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks has been provided in a safe and convenient manner. Parking on the site is limited and no changes are being proposed to the parking area. 11.2433, not applicable. Provision for access to adjoining properties is not an issue. The new pedestrian pathway was proposed and approved to connect the two homes in place of an existing deteriorated pathway. That was part of a previous site plan review. And there's also a new pedestrian pathway connecting the homestead and the administrative offices at 20 Triangle Street. 11.2434, not applicable. No new driveways are being proposed. 11.2435, <clears throat> not applicable. Joint access driveways between adjoining, adjoining properties are not an issue. No changes are being proposed to the driveways. Each building has its own driveway. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement will be waived, I'm assuming. There, there's very little traffic expected to enter and leave the site given the limited amount of parking on site. And 11.2437, not applicable, no traffic impact report will be required. So those are the findings. Do we agree with those findings? I believe so. Um, you know, I think with with the well, Doug has his hand up. Doug, I was just going to say I I would approve them as amended. Yeah. That's right. Approve as amended. Okay. And do you want me to go through the conditions that I've drafted now? Uh, I can't put my hands on them. Um, I can, Jack. As them, you, you can put them up. If you hold on one second. There we go. Can you see them? Yep. So yep. Um, I left out all those construction logistics things because this project isn't big enough and I'm trying to figure out a way of including those in the future without overwhelming people. But anyway, um, the conditions for this uh, draft conditions are the development shall be built substantially in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved on, and I would put today's date in if you approve it today. Um, number two, development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on. Again, that would be today's date if you approve this today. Um, Number three, changes to the project or substantial changes to any proposed site plans or to the exterior of the generator chiller area shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change 
and or determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the site plan approval. And the last one I was, I was thinking there might be lighting. Um, and it says, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. And I could add the words, if any. And then um, exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. So do you agree with those conditions or do you want to add any conditions? Yeah, I think Andrew does, doesn't this, uh, is this consistent what, with what your concerns were? Yep, it is. Okay. Were you, were you thinking we should add a condition if lighting is added um, to the enclosed area, it shall be dark sky compliant? Right. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so does um, Johanna want to add the approval of the conditions and findings as amended to her motion to approve? That's exactly what I want to do, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and who, uh, oh, I think it was Tom Long who um, seconded. Second again. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any other further comment? I guess um, can open it up to the the public if we haven't yet. <laughs> um, you did do that, Jack. Yeah, we already did that. All right. So we're we're good in there. All right. So um, any further discussion amongst the board? I see none, so we can just do a roll call. Um, Maria? You're muted. Approve. Okay. Um, Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. And Joanna? Aye. And myself was aye. So that's six zero. Thank you, Jane and uh, Shanti. Oh, Jane, you have your hand up? Uh, no. only, only just to say thank you for your site visit today and for your good questions. Um, we really appreciate uh, your approval of this and um, look forward to a, a successful project and to uh, reopening with a fantastically restored homestead um, next spring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Good night. All righty. So Chris, what do we have coming up with this, the next item here? Because I thought this is going to be continued and just how are we going to get through this? So the next item, what you need to do is you need to open the public hearing for the special permit SPP 2021-03. And then um, you will entertain a request to continue all of the public hearings related to the archipelago project to either um, June 30th or July 7th and I let's see I have five members of the planning board who have said they're available on June 30th and I have four members who've said they're available on July 7th but maybe when you get around to that um, to that uh, continuation we can talk about that a little more but right now what you need to do is open the public hearing for the special permit uh, that's the first one listed on the um, agenda. And then after that, we can talk about the continuation. Chris, okay. can I point out that it's only 720 and we have um, advertised that the public hearings would open at 730? Thanks. That's yeah. right. You're welcome. Um, I did notice, Jack, that you've skipped over the general public comment earlier. Okay. So if you um, wanted to, 
if Chris thought that was a good idea, we could go back to the general public comment period. That's great. Go. Did I, I did skip over that. I'm sorry. I didn't see any hands raised, raise, but um, I, certainly, I, didn't... I should have, I should have opened it up. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so at this time, uh, public comment period on items that are not on the uh, this evening's agenda. Mm. So I see none. And we can, <clears throat> we can do, you know, skip down to the form A. Mm -hmm. We do have a form A and Pam can bring that up on the screen. It's on a road called Blossom down in South Amherst. And um, the property that's outlined in yellow is one of the two properties that's being um, altered. So the property in yellow is a flag lot with its access point off Southeast Street. And the property right to the west of that is um, a lot that's at the end of Blossom Lane. And what's happening here is, uh, as far as we can tell, this property at the end of Blossom Lane was not part of the subdivision of Blossom Lane. It was created later, I believe. But in any event, what um, what's trying to be corrected here with the change in the property line, and I think that red line is, yeah. Pam did a good job in trying to represent it, but I think that red line should actually be on the other side of the yellow line. And what they're trying to do, um, the, the people who own 23D67, uh, which is the property right at the end of the Blossom Lane, um, have built a fence on the property of um, the flag lot. And so they are proposing to purchase a little strip of land and if you could make this a little bit bigger, Pam, if you could. Um, yeah, that. I'm working on it, Chris. Let's see. Um, Is that, yeah, does that just, help? It helps a little. There's a tiny triangular piece of land here um, that's along this property. That's right. Line, property here. Line. Yeah, and they're proposing to Oops. purchase that from the flag lot. Um, it doesn't really have any negative impact on the flag lot, but it means that the people who own parcel two will now be have their fence on their own property and um, can maintain it as they choose. So that's what this is all about. So then you will be asked if you would authorize Jack Jemsick to sign this plan as approval not required, meaning it doesn't need to go through the subdivision control process. And you can uh, um, sort of acknowledge that by consensus or Jack can take up a vote, whichever. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Johanna. Thank you. Um, it's possible this is not germane, but did they just screw up and put the fence on the pro wrong property? And rather than taking down the fence and repositioning it onto their own property, this is like the path of least resistance? Well, I think that's the case. But I also think that there was some um, potential error on the part of a surveyor previously. Um, if you look really closely at this ANR plan, you see uh, something that says line as shown mathematically in plan book. And then they reference a plan book 107, page 81, um, which sort of indicates to me that there was some difference between the way the line was drawn and the way it was described, but I'm not sure about that. Um, but in any event, the uh, fence did end up on the neighbor's property and the neighbor wants his fence back. So. Hmm. Is the, the property um, that is, I think not, is it 57? Not 67. The property abutting 67 to the to the east. Property abutting 57 to the to the wow. The one 67. that is outlined in yellow on the plan that Pam uh, created 
is 57 and that's the flag lot and the property to the west of that is 67 and that's the one that has the fence on the wrong side yeah. of the line. so lot 57 has nothing developed on it right now no but there is it's had a a flag lot a special permit for a flag lot ever since 1974 okay. and um, they're actually in the process of renewing their special permit for the flag lot and um, Maureen Pollock is in charge of that. So I've made her aware of this ANR that's coming through. Okay. Um, any objection amongst the board for this modification? I see none. All right. Good. So I'll be bugging Jack to come and sign it, or I will drive down to his house to have him sign it. Thank you. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications. <clears throat> we do have some of those as well. Um, bear with me. So the first thing that I thought that I would mention at your last meeting, we talked about um, the project at 187 College Street and you folks thought you would like to see a presentation. Uh, it's a change of use um, to go from a one family detached dwelling to a non owner occupied duplex. So that applicant is going to come to provide you a presentation on June 16th. I believe that's the right date. And then the next three applications are new to ZBA. So at 120 Southeast Street, um, they're proposing to add a 10 by 18 mudroom onto an existing house. And there's also a foundation there, there's a patio. So the new mudroom is going to go onto the house, but also onto the patio. And that's at 120 Southeast Street. Um, at 300 North Pleasant Street, they are also requesting a change of use special permit. The existing vet clinic um, they have received permission to demo that building and they are proposing to build a one dwelling unit which will have four bedrooms. Um, there is an existing one family detached dwelling on that property as well and that will remain. So the existing veterinary clinic is sort of a little bit behind the existing building. And then at the Wildwood Cemetery or 70 Strong Street, they're seeking a special permit to construct a new maintenance garage, which would be 36 feet by 64 feet, um, as well as to install two new signs. They would both be on Strong Street. One would be at the main entry, uh, and then there would be a smaller sign that is sort of in the directional or address sign. And that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. All right, so it's seven, uh, I have 7.30. Um, so we can go back to the public hearing, um, site plan review and special permit, uh, SPP 2021-03 Archipelago Investments. LLC has the project 11-13 uh, East Pleasant Street, and they're requesting a special permit for a non-conforming building to be structurally altered and enlarged or reconstructed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw for a mixed use building uh, proposed under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. And, um, Chris, what do we, we hearing from the applicant or not? I'm not sure if the applicant is here. I don't see the applicant um, in the attendees list. We do have a 
request from the applicant in the form of an email, which okay. I forwarded to the planning board uh, earlier this week, and Pam might be able to bring that up. Um, essentially, what the applicant is asking for is that all of the um, public hearings that are related to his project at um, 11 East Pleasant Street be continued to a date certain in the future. So here he's saying this email is to request that the public hearings for 11 East Pleasant and 15 East Pleasant be continued to either June 30th or July 7th. So um, I gave so I can read in the next two items and then we can kind of um, discuss yeah. the rescheduling as I sound. Yeah, it would be actually the next three items. There are two more on this page and one on the next page. Well, I did the first one. Oh, there are four altogether. Oh. Uh, am I wrong about that? Oh, there's Wait, three. No, you did the first one. There are three. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So the the uh, the second one is is uh, SPR 2021-07 and SPP 2021-02 for Archipelago Investment uh, LLC at 11 East Pleasant Street, a joint public hearing to request site plan review approval for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with uh, ground floor retail commercial, including approximately 1,300 square feet of retail space, lobby, leasing, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, elevator, parking, and 55 apartments under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw and request a special permit to modify dimensional requirements for height, side, and rear setback under footnote A of table three, section six of the zoning bylaw. And the third is SPR 2021-09, Archipelago Investments LLC, 15 East Pleasant Street. Request site plan review approval under section 5.00 of the zoning bylaw for an accessory and incidental use to a permitted principal use on an adjacent lot for construction, staging, and management of the 11 East Pleasant Street project. Post-construction uh, site will be stabilized with asphalt surface and vents. So they have proposed uh, those two dates, June 30th, July 7th. Um, and I, you know, so there's not an applicant uh, presentation. Should we take, well, public, con or excuse me, uh, the discussion amongst the board first um, on this continuation? Andrew? Yeah, I was only, only going to say, Chris, I indicated I'd be available for both days. I'm not available on June 28th. I, I looked at the wrong week, so I think that gets us. But June 30th, yeah, that I, I, I can make the July. I cannot make the June. Okay, thank you. So what, what's, what's the statistics there then uh, for the June 30th versus July 7th? I have Tom Long, uh, Johanna Newman, Maria Chow, uh, Janet McGowan, Jack Jemsick, and I didn't hear from Doug Marshall about June 30th. Doug. At the moment, I am available on both weeks. Okay. My apologies if I didn't reply earlier. Okay. And um, Janet, or not, not Janet, Maria may or may not be available on the 7th. We don't know that yet. So why don't we continue to June 30th, and if worse comes to worse and the applicant isn't ready, then you can um, always continue to another date certain in the future. Um, so do you want to do that, continue to okay. June when you have uh, six out of seven members available? Yeah. Uh, what about public comment on this? Um, well, it could be in the form of... Um, a procedural question, I think, but I don't think you would want to take um, public comment that's related to the contents of the cases because the applicant isn't here and we're sure. not taking testimony. Oh, I think Pam had her, Pam Rooney had her hand up. I'll check in with her, see what her. Oh, she has put it down. Oh, she put it down. Okay. All right. Uh, so someone I'm going to move uh, for the June 30th continuation of this hearing. So moved. Andrew, okay, second. 
I'll second. All right. That was Tom. Tom, and, okay. And, and you further this actually seconded and Tom first. Tom, oh. am I correct? <laughs> That's right. Yes. Huh. All right. Um, any further discussion? See none. So let's uh, do a roll call for that uh, continuation. Maria? Um, a per, uh, yes. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself as an I. And I forgot to ask about the time. So June 30th. Um, are you going to say that it would be 6.35 on June 30th? Yeah, I think it's, we should, if that agenda is, is well, we're having um, the hearing just for this purpose, correct? Yep. It's nothing, yeah, so this, yeah, so 6.35. 6.35, kind of, okay, good. Uh, okay. Kind of taken for granted there, but very good. All right, so old business. We have proposed changes to the demolition delay zoning bylaw, uh, repeal section 13, uh, demolition delay of the zoning bylaw, adopt new general bylaw for preservation of structures of historical uh, uh, of significance. So we have a presentation from the planning department. Ben? I'd like to make an introductory statement first. Okay. Just in context, so uh, Ben, uh, Ben Breger, uh, one of our planners is going to give the presentation, but um, I just wanted to say a few words. So uh, to explain why are we doing this? Why are we uh, proposing to change the demolition delay bylaw? And um, Rob Mora may have a few comments at the end of my statement. Um, for many years, the planning department staff, the building commissioner and the historical commission have recognized that there are problems with the existing demo delay bylaw. The language is unclear, the process is unclear, the bylaw contradicts itself, and these are among other things, among other problems. If the process were followed as written, it would be difficult to complete the review within the allotted time. The notifications process for publishing legal ads, posting meetings, and notifying abutters conflicts with itself. Um, because of confusion and the cumbersome aspects of the timelines, there have been instances where when constructive grants of demolition permits have happened, meaning that there hasn't been a good review, it's just gone through because um, we didn't meet timelines. Um, the new bylaw will improve clarity and efficiency. Um, we hope it will cut down somewhat on the workload of the Historical Commission and it will provide more predictability for applicants. We've looked at a new model that's rec been recommended by the state. Um, planning staff, members of the Historical Commission um, we invited Chris Skelly, who used to work for the Mass Historical Commission, to give us a seminar on demolition delay and how it's being handled by other municipalities and what the state's recommendations are. So we learned a lot from that seminar, and we're incorporating aspects of what we learned into this uh, proposed bylaw. Um, the Planning Department staff and the Building Commissioner recommend repealing Article 13 demolition delay from the existing zoning bylaw and adding a section to the general bylaw entitled Preservation of Historically Significant Buildings. Um, Rob Mara may have some more to add to that, but if not, then we would be ready for um, the presentation by Ben Breger. Thank you, Ben, or thank you, Chris, <laughs> Ben. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, I also just wanted to recognize too that Jane Wald is still here and as a panelist, and she's the uh, chair of the Historical Commission. Um, so we'll likely have things to add as well to this conversation. Um, and you're a little bit muffled. Okay. Uh, can you hear me better now at all? Still sort of not really. All right. No, no more headsets. Is that better? That's better. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just saying that Jane Wald is still here in attendance and she's the chair of the historical commission. Um, and so I uh, would be invited to uh, comment on the demolition delay bylaw as well. Um, but I will give a brief presentation. Um, ben, you might just want to talk louder. I'm not sure about your audio, but it just, just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll volume. Be great. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. 
Um, so I am sharing my screen, correct? Yes. So yeah, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about what you know. What is the demolition delay bylaw? Um, how it's you know been used in Amherst, and then kind of go over some of the issues with the bylaw, and then talk about what we're proposing um, to replace it. So, just briefly, um, demolition delay bylaw. Uh, as of April 2020, 160 towns in Massachusetts have some sort of demolition delay bylaw. Um, so it's a you know fairly popular uh, bylaw, and you know has. Um, been adopted by many towns in Massachusetts. Uh, the purpose of the demolition delay bylaw is really, you know, I think of it as a pause button. It, it provides an opportunity to, uh, you know, press pause on a proposed demolition um, for a historically significant building and gives the historical commission regulatory authority to, um, you know, place the delay on the demolition but then work with an applicant to find an alternative to demolition um, so we don't uh, lose, you know, a, you know, permanently lose a historically significant building. So during the demolition delay period, which uh, the historical commission, you know, typically works with the applicant to, you know, investigate, you know, alternatives, whether it's, you know, relocating the, uh, the property, the structure, I mean, uh, you know, restoring it, some sort of adaptive reuse, uh, finding another owner who might be interested in saving the structure. And, you know, in, in Amherst, uh, we have a 12 month delay period. Um, some towns have six, most have 12, some have 18, and some uh, towns are even moving towards a 24 month uh, delay period. So, in Amherst, um, the demolition delay bylaw Article 13 was first adopted in 1999 and was subsequently amended in 2005. Um, I think that's when they extended it from six to 12 months. Uh, here's just two examples of buildings that have been saved uh, from demolition in the past few years. The uh, uh, Bertucci's building uh, was a former auto, automobile shop from 1946 that had some unique architectural uh, features and was an important building for the development of downtown and the historical commission placed a delay on the demolition and was able to, you know, the building was saved and a new owner was found and uh, it, you know, will continue to be a functioning restaurant space in, in downtown. Uh, likewise, the home on South Pleasant Street, which is an Amherst College home, uh, Amherst College property, uh, 1862. Uh, demolition delay was placed on that property and gave the historical commission time to work with the, uh, with the owners to uh, hopefully relocate the building. Um, still to be determined the exact date of that property, but uh, it was not, uh, the 12 month delay saved it from imminent uh, demolition. So um, a demolition delay bylaw has a lot of different kind of components and, you know, the state puts out a model bylaw, but then each town kind of tweaks it to their specific context. So there's just a lot of different things that uh, it's seemingly could would be simple, but, you know, actually has a lot of nuance involved, such as the definition of a building, you know, how do you exactly define demolition? You know, what are the different thresholds for review and the criteria for uh, determining significance? You know, the length of the demo delay period um, and, you know, various other things. So in Amherst, this is kind of the current bylaw um, and it kind of just pointing out some of the issues with the bylaw. Uh, we have a vague definition of demolition and that's led to um, it, it requires the building commissioner to uh, provide a lot of interpretation for like, you know, exactly when to send things to the historical commission uh, versus just, um, you know, approving it or, you know, reviewing it administratively. So the definition of demolition currently, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but it's, you know, 
dot, 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 destroying, removing, or raising a structure or portion thereof. So it's that little uh, clause there, or portion thereof, which has caused a lot of uh, confusion, I guess, about what exactly, you know, a portion could be anywhere from, you know, trim on a windows to, you know, an entire addition on a building. So it's, uh, we're, we're proposing to clarify that definition um, for demolition. Uh, you know, similarly, the definition of a structure, um, you know, is a, you know, involves a lot of nuance. Um, that's basically staying the same. Uh, we have a threshold of 50 years. Um, so a, a structure that's 50 years or older is kind of the first uh, age-based age -based threshold for, um, for getting into the historical commission review process. Uh, and that's not gonna change. We're proposing to keep that 50 years. Um, similarly, you know, we have 11 criteria in section 13.4. Uh, that we use to determine significance. Um, that also, uh, you know, there's some that are very, very, very specific criteria, but then also some that are very vague and can almost be interpreted to catch every and all structures. So we're proposing to kind of uh, clean up that language a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, I think, um, I'll get into more details, but you know we're you know the demolition delay length is 12 months. Uh, that'll stay the same. Um, and kind of one important thing too is uh, there's no appeals process built into the demolition delay process right now, and that's another reason we're proposing to move it out of zoning and into the general bylaw. Um, so then we can write in an appeals process uh, that would likely operate similar to the local historic district commission. Um, the local historic district, their bylaw is in the general bylaw as well. Um, so we would uh, copy, essentially uh, use their appeals process as to guide this uh, bylaw. And so, yeah, just some of the issues, uh, you know, there's a high, there's a high caseload for the historical commission. So um, because of you know, there's that first age-based threshold of any building that's proposed for demolition that's 50 years or older, which at this point is uh, a lot of buildings, um, that would be sent to the historical commission. And also, you know, there's the vague definition of demolition. So uh, it could mean, you know, small changes on many homes or, or buildings uh, are being sent to the historical commission um, and so, you know, get it, it, it does start to add up. There's a high case load. Last meet, last few weeks ago, we had the core four demolition hearings, um, you know, and they kind of, they add up and it, you know, does take away from some of the other good work of the historical commission. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's sometimes uh, for an applicant, you know, they might not think that what they're doing warrants going to the historical commission. So um, this could be a way of kind of making the process more efficient. Um, yeah, like I said, the definitions are somewhat vague. Uh, and also kind of this uh, bullet point down here. Um, yeah, where's my cursor? Yeah. The, uh, right now there's not, we, we kind of do it anyway in the historical commission. Um, we work, we try to work proactively with applicants during the hearing and after delay has been placed to work with the applicant to preserve the building, uh, whether it's through re relocation, restoration, you know, finding a new owner. But we, we wanted to kind of spell out that process a little bit more clearly in the bylaw. Um, and then finally, there's uh, this issue that kind of really only affects, you know, internal town staff, you know, operations that are Historical commission review process is now intermingled with the building permit process. So, and they operate on different timelines. So when someone submits a demolition permit application, it both starts the historical commission clock and the building permit clock. And so um, that has caused some issues, certainly because uh, 
yeah, for, for a variety of reasons. So we're proposing to kind of pull those processes apart so that someone um, can just submit, a, so they can know essentially if they'll have a delay placed on their property first, and then they, and then um, once they've gone through that process, they can apply for the demolition permit. Um, so yeah, and finally, yeah, and also the appeals process. So these are these uh, flow charts I made um, that kind of show how the process works essentially. So um, starting from the left, and this is how the current bylaw functions. Someone, an applicant submits a demolition permit application, staff uh, reviews it and first looks at, is it meet the definition of demolition and is the building 50 years or older? Um, if it's, you know, yes to those, then it goes to the historical commission. And if no, if it's, you know, less than 50 years and does not, and it's not really demolition, then it's, you know, we can issue the demo permit. If it goes to the commission, the commission then has two purposes at its public hearing. It's, uh, and you know, it's a duly advertised public hearing with notice to abutters uh, and, you know, legal ads and um, a lot of, work goes into, obviously, as you guys know, a lot of work goes into um, getting ready for a public hearing. And at that public hearing, uh, we'll determine the, uh, if the building is significant. And then if it is significant, um, based on those 11 criteria, then it goes, and then we look at, uh, will the demolition um, of the historic, uh, be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage of the community? And so um, there's kind of three outcomes from that uh, public hearing. If it's not significant, then we issue the demo permit. If it, it can be found to be significant, but the impact would not be detrimental. Uh, so that could, you know, the demo permit would then be issued. And then when the delay is placed, that's when a building is found to be significant and there would be a detrimental impact um, of the demolition. So. Uh, those are kind of the three outcomes from the public hearing. And so what we're proposing um, is that the, there's the, the step to determine significance is taken out of that public hearing and is done um, by staff and a member of the historical commission with uh, using a revised set of criteria, which I'll show in a second. But essentially, uh, that serves two purposes. So um, the idea is that it cuts down on the caseload for the historical commission. Um, because only buildings that are significant found to be significant are being sent to the commission. And two, it also, um, you know, makes the process more efficient for applicants, so they don't have to wait. Um, you know, upwards of 30 days for just the hearing to begin. And so if, if it's not a significant building. So um, in this you know, proposal, uh, staff and a member of the historical commission would review for the for now three different things. Definition of def, def, definition of demolition, uh, the 50 year or older threshold, and then whether the building is found to be significant. Um, if, if it's no, then the demo permit is issued. And um, if yes to those items, then at the historical commission, then, you know, has a duly advertised public hearing um, 30 days later, where after a lot of more information and research has been carried out. And then at this public hearing, the historical commission is really only focusing on whether or not to place the delay. Um, and, you know, we've had, uh, so that I think is what, where the historical commission wants to be. They want to be focusing on the detrimental impact of the demolition um, and spending more time on that rather than, you know, looking at significance for um, more buildings. So, um, sorry, I'll just go back to here. I think I just wanted to mention too, uh, the um, we're also adding in this uh, uh, ability, I guess, um, of the commission 
the historical commission often want uh, asks about the future plans for a property. So there we're often faced with the building is being taken down and we have to, you know, the historical commission judges the um, historical aspects of the existing building, but then is often left wondering what's going to take its place. Is it uh, a, a, you know, a building that's going to be equally or could it, would it be a building that has, you know, architectural value, you know, contributes to the architectural and historical value of the neighborhood. Um, and so we're, we propose, we're, the, we're proposing to add um, the ability, I guess, during this public hearing for the historical commission to um, consider the owner's plans for reuse reconstruction or restoration on the property and actually spell that out rather than um, just kind of being silent on the issue altogether. Um, yeah, I think I've hit, the, hit these points. Um, the definition of demolition is down here. Um, it's kind of long, but the uh, we want to basically, there's kind of three, three parts to it. There's um, kind of total destruction of an entire building. Um, so that would be complete demolition. There's a second one, which is partial demolition. So pulling down, destroying or raising, we're calling it saying 25 or more, 25% or more of the front, back or side elevations. Um, uh, with the gross square footage. Okay, yeah, 25% or more of the front, back, or side elevations. That, that's in line with how other communities um, measure uh, demolition um, based off of like a partial amount. And then finally, this kind of, <clears throat> this third point, which is changing, modifying, or removing important architectural elements from a structure, which define the historic integrity of the design. So that could be kind of unique features of a building um, that kind of add to the historic integrity of, of the building. Um, we, and we do have some exemptions in there as well. So um, <clears throat> I kind of went over this already, the two, the two stop, two step process for review. Um, this is kind of the new significance criteria that uh, staff and the historical commission um, member would use to determine significance and whether it needs to go to a public hearing. So um, essentially, if the building is listed on the National Register of Historic Places or the Massachusetts State Register of Historic Places, um, would be number one. If the building has value in association with the location or one or more historic persons or events or with the broad architectural, social, political, economical, or cultural heritage of the town of Amherst, or the building um, alone in the context of a group of buildings, or as part of the viewshed, has historical or architectural value as to period, style, craftsmanship, method of building, construction, or in association with a recognized architect or builder. So essentially, the building has architectural value or was built um, with a, by a recognized architect or builder. Um, I kind of went over this a little bit already, just the new criteria for determining whether to put a delay, kind of allowing the commission to look at plans for reuse, reconstruction, or restoration, but otherwise, you know, looking at whether the, you know, this kind of loftier question of whether the building would represent a loss to the Amherst community if demolition authorization were granted. talked about this already and then <clears throat> talked about this already just kind of separating out those two processes and so yeah I just wanted to kind of re reiterate that um, we're looking to remove this from zoning bylaw and add it to general bylaw so um, I'm not exactly sure kind of how that process works with town council and all of that but um we would need planning board support i guess to look at certainly look at the rescinding this from zoning 
and just making sure you guys are all comfortable that what we're adding to general bylaw, you know, um, you know, meets, you know, is something you all feel comfortable with uh, when recommending to take this out of zoning. So, um, yeah, I know that was a lot, and this might be new to some folks, but thanks for bearing with me. And uh, let, certainly let me know if you have any clarifying questions or if I can make anything more clear. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Uh, so, Chris, um, what's the our, the objective here? Are we providing a recommendation to Not the CRC? Yet. You don't have to provide a recommendation yet. This is um, this, this is informational. It's informational, and it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. It's probably going to go. I don't think it's going to go back to CRC again. But um, if you're comfortable with it at this point, we could bring it to town council. Um, but I think it might have to go back to the historical commission one more time. I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah. we're trying to get it to a point where we can bring it to town council and have them refer it back for a public hearing. And I wanted to let you know, in case you haven't read your email today, that Janet McGowan did submit comments um, about this demo delay bylaw. And so you might, might want to have time to read her comments and then um, we can address her comments either now or uh, at a future time. Um, so it's really an opportunity for you to talk, ask questions, tell us what you like and don't like, anything that you want us to change, et cetera. And Rob Mora is here and he's been really quite involved in the development of this bylaw. So he's available to answer questions if you, uh, if you wanted to ask him questions. Okay. Uh, so Andrew and then Doug. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Ben. Um, so um, just want to make sure it's clear too. When you mentioned was was the primary reason of moving uh, moving it out of zoning is to enable the appeal process. So I, I thought I heard you say earlier is that is that the primary driver for this? That. Um... That's my understanding. I think that uh, it, it, it's to add the information about the fuel process. And then, you know, I think just like on a broader level, you know, zoning is more to do with the regulation of land use, I guess, whereas this is kind of, you know, a bit more about, you know, what you can and can't do with the building, I guess, and, you know, value for the town overall. Um, so I, I, that's how that decision was made. And, it, you know, it's another thing that most communities have it in the general bylaw. Um, and it, most communities have this in the general bylaw. And it's, uh, it's also how we treat the local historic district as well. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying. Um, and then a couple quick sort of follow-ups to, to that. Um, one would be, it might be useful then on the chart your flow chart to have like a loop back for what that appeal process would look like. I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, if you do choose to appeal, where do you kind of come back into the, to the process? So like visually that I would find that to be like uh, a useful add to that. Um, I was also curious um, what happens if the age of the building is unknown. And I'm thinking like, like an out structure or like outbuilding or some, some type of non like residential building. Um, like, do we do we round up? Like, what what's do we just kind of associate it with the 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 age of the actual house? Just curious if anybody had a had a thought or knew anything about that. May I answer that? Sure, Chris. I believe the way it works is if the age is unknown, we assume it's fifty years or older. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay, and then one other uh, quick question I had was just. Um, could you just uh, explain a little bit more about what happened with Bertucci's in 2018? So I, I know it was Bertucci's and then it was Porta and now it's going to be the new restaurant. So, it, but I don't remember the timing. So like Bertucci's closed and then was there a change of ownership? Uh, like, I'm just curious to see how this actually manifests itself. That's, uh, that's before my time. So my, uh, first year of the call. I think I can help with that and Rob might be able to help too. But um, so Bertucci's closed. Um, there was a, a landowner who owned 
the Bertucci's property and several other properties. I think they might have owned four or five properties in the general vicinity. And they um, had a proposal to build a mixed use building there. And at that same time, or around that same time, they um, applied to demolish the Bertucci's building. And I think the, um, his, the Historical Commission may have felt some pressure of the public. I'm not sure, maybe Jane has a better interpretation of this. But um, anyway, uh, I think the public was, um, was had heightened awareness about this as a result of the mixed use building being proposed. And um, so when the Historical Commission reviewed the Bertucci's building demolition application, they felt that you know they really wanted to try to preserve that building rather than having it torn down and having something else built in its place. That's kind of my memory of it. Um, but again, Rob or Jane might have a more detailed memory. Uh, Jane, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, I can only add uh, just a little bit to that. And uh, I, in the general outlines that Chris um, has presented are, are those that I remember. Um, uh, there was also um, a proposal from a member of the public uh, community member uh, for considering a way to reuse that space. And so that uh, uh, reuse the space as it essentially as it exists. And so that that also helped to influence the historical commission to think that there might be an adaptive reuse possibility, and wanted to work with the owner uh, about that. Um, so, okay, so so it was the same owner, and they they just determined that you know facing this this twelve month delay. Um, it would be easier or more beneficial for them to reuse it and abandon their, their plans for the mixed use building. Yeah, I think that's right. And I believe that they took uh, Porta as a tenant uh, after the, the historical commission review and uh, demolition delay. Okay. okay, great. I'm, ju I'm just trying to understand how this actually plays out in in real world situations here. So I appreciate the, the, the back story. Thanks. Hey, uh, just to continue on that, I, uh, <clears throat> when a building like paints, it, you know, has a new coat of paint and all that, we, we review signs, but that seems like things kind of happened at that site that um, just happened. And I was wondering if the process was uh, consistent with our bylaws with regard to Porta. More, more review. <laughs> uh, Chris, do you? Well, I would say that the um, Porta didn't really pay attention to what was required to open a restaurant or change the facade of the building or really much of anything. They really were, I'll use the term scoff laws because they were that in many ways. And they were that in the way of starting their business and also in operating their business. So I think it wasn't a very successful um, start. And we have some new people who are uh, trying to open a restaurant there now and they are much more cooperative and um, doing what they need to do to abide by the rules. And I think they'll be good tenants. Great. Okay, so we have Doug, then Tom. Doug? Yeah, thanks, Jack, and thanks, Ben. Um, my question has to do with a if, if a property is in a local historic district, um, you know, I can imagine with this bifurcated process that uh, someone would apply for a demolition and be approved by the Historic Commission and then they have to kind of do the same thing over again later when they try to get a building permit, but have to go through the local historic district commission. Um, it, could you explain the relationship and whether the, there's, there's improved coordination between those reviews 
uh, for a demolition request in a local historic district? Um, so uh, I'll say that this, uh, the proposal doesn't do anything to clarify that um, process. Uh, I think right now um, there would be a review by both commissions. If, if a demolition application is submitted for a property in the local historic district, um, it would be reviewed by historical commission and local historic district commission. Um, and so far there hasn't been any uh, conflicting um, votes on that. They're, they typically vote uh, together, I guess, but um, I think on I, I think you do raise a good point about what what that would look like. And um, I know in some other communities uh, that have a local historic district, the the local historic district has sole kind of authority in that area, and the historical commission does not um, kind of review demolitions there. But I'd be curious to kind of learn a little bit more about that history and kind of uh, how that's been handled in the past. Well, I, I, I can imagine that there's rarely a disagreement between the two about yeah. the significance of a building. I'm more interested in whether we're taking a timeline that now takes, say, three months to get through both of those entities, and now it takes six months or you know have we made things worse from a timeline point of view or i see or not Dana, Chris, did you want to may i say a few things yes chris so um i think you could probably do the reviews simultaneously you wouldn't have to do them one after another and the other thing is that the Historical Commission has power to impose a demolition delay of 12 months, but the Local Historic District Commission actually has a power to prevent de demolition completely. So those are two different um, levels of power with regard to demolition. That's all I wanted to say. Jane Wald has her hand up. Hey, okay, Jane. And then Tom. Yeah, um, it, the way it's actually worked in practice, I mean, uh, Ben is correct that, um, that, and Chris is correct, that there can be two um, hearing processes, but the way it's worked in practice is that the Historical Commission recognizes that the local Historic District Commission actually has more regulatory um, ability uh, than the Historical Commission which has only uh, the tool of demolition delay. Uh, so in general, um, if a property has been, is, in with, is within one of the local historic districts um, overseen by the commission, um, it, it's, it's basically the historical commission's position that that would take precedence. And um, in practice, there have, I think there have seldom been to reviews. Well, isn't it true that the local historic district review isn't triggered until you show up for a building permit with with Rob Mora? The are you talking about the local historic district commission or the local or the historical commission? Local the historic local. district commission. Um, I think probably Chris or Ben can answer that better than I can, but I, it's been my, um, well, for example, my experience with the Emily Dickinson Museum is that the, that plans need to be presented in a, in a, in a kind of sequential process, including the local historic district commission before getting to the point of requesting a building permit. So a local historic district okay. commission review actually would happen um, prior in the process prior to review by the historical commission. 
Okay, thank you. Great, Tom. Sure, thanks. Um, I have a question and I'm trying to figure out how to actually phrase it in a way that um, allows us to have a conversation about it. So I'm imagining the capacity for individuals to have significant loss by way of fact that not all of these historic buildings have been archived and are publicly known and that I can invest in a property, maybe a residential one, expecting to take down this piece of uh, this, this shed, barn, whatever it is on that property and not finding out until on that demo that this is this is an issue. And, and I'm wondering, A, is there a process by which that owner can find out whether this is significant before they buy that land? So does that, and in this case, does that then go through planning staff or does that go to the store historical commission and secondly is there any protection for that owner who buys this piece of land um, with this expectation that they're going to demo something and improve that property value and instead cannot cannot do that and might have the maybe in a bit enabled to sell that property again um, for what it was worth so i guess i'm the, the question is what is how, what is this relationship to the individual owner and, and what are the processes by which they might protect themselves or be protected by this process? So Chris or Ben? So I would say that um, sort of, uh, let's see, usually smart owners, you can't expect everybody to be smart, but usually smart owners will contact us before they purchase the property and ask what they can do there. And um, along with what can you do, you know, what can't you do? And we would, um, usually we meet with people who come to us. We meet as a group and we share information with them about, you know, potential need to go to the historical commission or local historic district or design review board or planning board or whatever it is. There could be people who buy property without, you know, doing that kind of due diligence. Um, and, you know, that's uh, unfortunate. But um, generally speaking, if people are going to make a big enough investment, they they would come to us and ask uh, questions. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply to single family homes. But for other types of property, it does apply. Tom, did Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Maria. Um, ben has his hand up. Maybe, did you want to answer a question, Ben, to the previous? Uh, yeah, I was just going to add to um, saying that the, the bylaw that we're proposing kind of adds in a step where uh, staff and a member of the historical commission would be able to quickly get someone an answer about whether a building is significant or not and would mean it wouldn't would not need to go to a public hearing whereas right now um that determination needs to be made at a public hearing you know duly advertised you know 14 days notice abutters being notified and so for the historical commission to even have that conversation um it, it's at a public hearing but the bylaw revision that we're proposing uh, makes that step more e easier, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, Maria? Uh, so yeah, I think that all these improvements are great because you're streamlining the process and um, I don't have a problem with moving it out of zoning into general if that's what sort of standard a lot of towns have been doing. Um, something previous in the previous comment kind of confused me about the it sounds like there is two steps. You do have to do the local historic commission before the historic commission, but maybe that's always been the case. It's not like anything you're proposing now, Ben, that you've been working on, you know, is, is causing that. It's just always been the case. So uh, yeah, I, I've had a lot of issue with this because I've had a lot of projects where it's too late, and, you know, the people will come to me and then I look and I'm like, oh, you're already non-conforming or oh, you're already historical in the local historic district. And 
So yeah, most people don't do this kind of research when they buy a house, maybe for commercial projects. But um, so yeah, it's, 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 I mean, I think Amherst has a reputation for being a town that, you know, they do everything by the book and it is tricky, but it's not like they're making it more difficult. It's just everything has to be by the book. So uh, yeah, I've had a lot of projects where we've had to go through a lot. Um, but uh, I just have a random question. So you were talking about the historic commission overseeing things. Uh, do they, for, for things that are on the national historical register, that doesn't fall, or, fall under any of this purview. That's just something that's unrelated to anything that this bylaw would be reviewing. Is that correct? Like there's a local historic district, but then there's national historic designations throughout town. Do you know if Chris that, has her hand up. Oh, okay. So usually the national register um, entity uh, only comes into play when someone is requesting uh, federal or state funds to do something on a property. Um, the designation that you're a national register property is really kind of honorific um, more than it is regulatory. Although um, it is being proposed as um, a, criteria, a criterion for deciding whether a building is significant or not. Oh, oh okay, all right. So is that different from before? Or is that always been the case? It's just, oh, okay. That's the same, yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Good, Andrew? Yeah, just hearing Maria um, and Tom, it, it almost makes me think like we just need good, I don't know if we necessarily need to outreach, but I just wonder if the, if the, the realtor community uh, stays plugged in with the town you know, relative to these types of changes or not. Um, but I think that's the primary source of information that, that you know, uh, that residential homeowner would come in is they'd, they'd run it by the realtor. So hopefully, hopefully the realtor community out there is uh, keeping up to speed on this. Very good. Um, uh, Jane, you have your hand up. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm talking too, too much, but um, I, that's a very good point about the realtor community. Um, there's also a state database of structures that have been basically evaluated or nominated to be historic structures. And that's, that's a, 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 a very easily accessible database. And there are probably, um, I might get the, the number, uh, misremember the number, but I, it's something like maybe 1,200 uh, buildings in Amherst that are in that database. And then we know from um, other surveys done over the years that there are probably another six to 900 buildings um, that should be added to that inventory. And that um, the Historical Commission has recognized that as a, as a good tool, you know, having a comprehensive inventory of buildings that might be eligible for some kind of review of this stuff, having that, having that put together and easily accessible and um, you know, provided to realtors and, um, and even perhaps mailings to homeowners. Um, that's kind of an ambition that has been an ambition of ours. Um, and maybe uh, you know, it's something that we'd, we'd like to see happen at some point in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, I don't see any other uh, hands in the board. Uh, we have public comment on this, Chris. You can have public comment, yep. Okay. Public is invited to speak on the demolition uh, delay zoning bylaw. And I see none. Okay. Um, so it's 8 uh, 26. So it looks like we might be able to wrap up here soon. Um, topics not reasonably anticipated uh, 48 hours prior to the meeting. I have no topics. And Pam just um, informed me about a few days ago that we only need to have this on the agenda once. We don't need to have it under new business and old business. So that's good news. So okay. We only need to say it once. 
Good, good. Um, and I guess uh, one thing we didn't hit was the upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. We have one application from Greenfield Savings Bank to install an ATM machine at the New Market Shopping Center. I don't. I may have mentioned that before, but that'll be coming to you sometime soon. New so Market yeah. Shopping Center. New Market Shopping Center is at the intersection of uh, Amity Street and University Drive, and they have a kind oh. of arched. Um, sign there they're going to okay. take the sign away and they're going to put a little area where you can drive in and you know get um do whatever you have to do at the uh, atm and that's um an accessory structure to the greenfield savings bank that exists in the building that's as part of that shopping center good good so uh, planning board committee and liaison reports um we had an executive committee last Thursday, but you know nothing of note. Um, we will have an annual meeting coming up of some sort. I don't think it's going to be in person, but um, I don't think that has been decided yet. So um, the community uh, community preservation act committee. The we got Andrew. No updates. Okay. And the Ag Commission, Doug? No updates. And Design Re Review Board, Tom? Um, we had our archipelago presentations postponed as uh, Planning Board did. Um, we had a review of some signage and awnings and outdoor space um, on Kellogg Street in the old Rayos space that was approved, um, just marginal changes. Um, we have a couple upcoming projects for some signage in Goberry, um, new signage for the, uh, the cemetery, um, uh, the West Cemetery, and I think we have um, a review of two um, new public bike stations that are coming up, and that's, uh, I believe, next week, so that's June 7th. Great. Now, are we are we still reviewing some of the signs, or is that is that changed? Or the planning board only needs to review signs that are in specific locations, like New Market Shopping Center is one of them, and the Big Y Shopping Center on University Drive. So it's usually written into the site plan review that there's a sign plan for those sites, and when signs are changed there, then those signs have to come to the planning board. Otherwise, you usually only review them when they're part of a site plan review application. <laughs> good, good. Um, and do you have an uh, update for the CRC? I was not able to attend the last CRC meeting, but Ben was there, and maybe he could give a brief report about what they talked about. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. They, well, we talked about the demolition delay bylaw. I presented it kind of gave the same presentation to them um, and uh, was able to incorporate their feedback into what I presented today. Uh, I honestly am blanking on what else we talked about. I was so focused on my bit. How did they act on our recommendations for the, the building moratorium and the inclusionary zoning bylaw? Um, yeah, there was, uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, uh, there was good discussion on both of those. Um, and I believe they voted to recommend uh, both. I don't think they voted on inclusionary zoning yet. That's no? coming up on June 8th. So I believe they voted on moratorium, but yeah. I don't think they voted on um, inclusionary zoning. Okay. And, and approval or, or, or disapproval of the moratorium? They voted not to support the moratorium. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, report of the chair. I guess I I'm, I'm interested in terms of how we're going to go back in person, um, and how that's going to work, and w what's the what's the game plan, to, or is there is it too early to to discuss? Have you heard anything, Chris? I think it's um, potentially too early. The earliest we would have to go back into um, in-person meetings would be June 15th, 
or anytime after June 15th. Um, we're going to have a meeting. <laughs> Staff is going to have a meeting with the town manager fairly soon. I can't remember the exact date, but it's you know within the next week or so. And he's going to inform us about you know what is upcoming. Um, my impression is that uh, well, I, I do know that the um, governor has filed some legislation um, in Boston to extend the ability to have remote meetings into the future. I think it's as far as September 1st. Um, so if that passes, then we would have the ability to have remote meetings until September 1st. And, and I think there's a lot of scrambling in Boston to try to figure out, you know, what does this, what does the end of the emergency mean? So, um, but I, I think, you know, we're probably good for a while to have remote meetings, but I'll let you know if that changes. Okay, because it came up uh, during the, the Pioneer Valley Community Commission with regard to you know, doing the combination of the Zoom and in person, and they I guess there's this feature called Owl, just like the bird, that works with Zoom, and it just I guess turns and looks at the person talking and and sort of thing, and um, so it's a nifty device, but. I'm just wondering, it's, you know, if we meet in person again, we're going to have to like generate all this paper, I think, unless we all have, you know, our laptops or iPads or things like that. It's just, it's just going to be, it's going to be a change to start meeting uh, in person. I'm, um, I am attached to all my screens and, and things like that. But, <laughs> um, I'm sure if you'll have lots to talk about uh, because we're not the only board, uh, obviously. So lots of opinions, I'm sure. Uh, re uh, report of staff. Chris. Can, oh, Andrew, oh, please. Um, so yeah, just, I, I wasn't sure too, just as part of that discussion, whether whether you anticipate a hybrid solution might be in place, or do you think it's all remote or all in person? So whenever those combos come up, you know, when, when the world's back to normal, I travel a fair amount uh, for work, and it would actually be super helpful um, for me to manage my time if I could, if I could remote in. Uh, to some of those meetings instead of uh, adjusting my travel schedule. So even if we do go back to fully in person, um, there is an option for individual members of boards and committees to act remotely. Um, as long as there's a quorum um, present on site and as long as the chair is present on site, you have to apply in advance. I think you have to apply to the chair and tell them I'm going to be away. May I remote in um, on this date? But that's already in place. Um, and I think that there are considerations about having hybrid types of meetings as we transition back to whatever the new normal is. But we don't really have any details about that yet. Thanks. Yeah, what's the, the, the one law that, that Steve Schreiber brought up um, where as long as you look at the video? Oh, that's the um, Mullen rule. Mullen rule, yeah, okay. Oh, so, that's, yeah. that's much different than you yeah. know, the live sort of Zoom interaction that we've become accustomed uh, to. And, and that would be a good thing to bring up um, for Andrew, who's potentially not able to come to the June 30th planning board meeting, that he could um, watch the video of that meeting and then um, at a subsequent meeting be able to vote on the archipelago projects. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so that's an option that's available. What you have to do is watch the video or read the material and the minutes of the meeting, and then you um, make a statement, a written statement. It's, I think it can be by email or handwriting or there are you know, different forms, but um, members of the planning board have taken advantage of this in the past and it's really useful because you're allowed to miss one meeting um, without consequence. Okay. Um, Great, I think. Sort of staff, oh. you asked me about that. Yes. I just wanted to encourage people to participate in the Juneteenth, Juneteenth celebration that's coming up on um, June 16th, which is in a couple of weeks. But um, part of that is going to be um, the public unveiling of these Civil War tablets that we've had ever since the late 1800s. They were created in the late 1800s by the Grand Army of the Republic um, in Amherst. And they're really quite amazing. They're big 
giant tablets with the names of people who um, fought in the Civil War. And Ben has been very instrumental in um, bringing them back and being able to uh, have them displayed. They're going to be displayed in the lower um, area of the bank center. And so you might want to just come by on Saturday and, uh, and see those Saturday, June 16th. And there'll be a lot of other um, events happening then too, but uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting time in Amherst. So I just wanted to mention that. Good to know. Thank you. So I think we, uh, we adjourn, what, 837? Thank you all. Our next meeting, do um, you have a meeting in, in two weeks? Yes, we do. Okay. On June 16th. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> June 16th. June. Is it June 16th? Yeah. It will be June 16th. Yeah. Yeah. Did I get that? My daughter's birthday. Oh, June 19th is the date of Juneteenth, right? Correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have the 18th off. Yeah. So I said the wrong thing. Oh, June okay. Juneteenth is planning board. June 19th is Juneteenth celebration. Very good. Okay. All right. Good evening, all. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. Right. Stop recording. You want to stop recording?